Hi, this is Rabbi Ed Feinstein of Valley Beth Shalom in Encino, California. This coronavirus plague has forced us to find new ways to connect with each other. Tonight, we have an opportunity to spend some time with Rabbi David Wolpe, the Max Webb Senior Rabbi of Sinai Temple in Los Angeles, distinguished and popular author, columnist, speaker, and rabbi. We've asked Rabbi Wolpe to reflect on how it is that this plague, this coronavirus, which has now upturned so much of our lives, could actually turn out to be a blessing, and what we've learned from this, and how it is we celebrate Passover in this time of continued slavery and bondage. Let's listen to Rabbi Wolpe. Thanks for being with us. Recording. Okay. David Wolpe, Rabbi Wolpe, it's a delight to have some time with you. It's uh, one of the ironies of social isolation that we live 20 minutes apart and my in-laws live exactly across the street from you. And I yet know. it takes this uh, plague in order to uh, bring us together. So it's really nice to spend some time. How are you doing? Good. I mean, there are, there are definitely some plague paradoxes. You know, you hear from people that you haven't heard from for a long time and, uh, you also speak to people that you don't speak to normally because not because they're far away or you don't have uh, something to talk to them about, but just because in the normal course of life, you don't take the time to do it. Right. And and, and it, what, what's remarkable about this, there's so many ironies to this, don't you think? We, yes. Our parents lived through the Great Depression and the Second World War yeah. and the Korean War and McCarthy. I was born in the time of political assassinations of Kennedy yep. and, and, and Kings. We saw the Vietnam crisis. As an adult, we saw 9-11. We lost a home in the earthquake. This is different. It is different. This, this I, 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 Barry Weiss wrote a wonderful column in the Times yesterday where she said something very interesting. This attacks us Jews at the very point of who we are. It attacks yep. our ability to connect with each other because we... We gain s sanity, much less sanctity, by connecting, by being in community, by sharing moments. And to drive us right. like this is so contrary. In some ways, you could make the case that the opposite of Judaism is social isolation. And I, I actually, the only analogy in a weird way that I can think of is during Soviet times, when you didn't know if your neighbor was also an enemy. You thought they might be, and you wanted to stay away from them because you didn't want to talk freely to them or you didn't want to open your heart to them. And everybody had suspicion of everyone else. That's a sort of social plague. This is an actual biological plague, and that makes it also so weird for us because the people that you normally turn to and embrace and care about and so on, they're the ones you're trying to avoid. Right. And, yeah, it's very hard. It's very strange. And then, you know, as rabbis in the middle of this, we were dealing with people in the normal course of their lifetime. So right. there was a baby born in our community this week. And the mom emailed me and said, look, I, we'd like to bring her to shul and have a naming, but we're, yeah. we don't want to expose the kids. So we're actually going to do a naming like this over the, over the, yes. over the Skype or whatever, over the TV. Yeah. Bar mitzvahs, weddings. I was at two funerals this weekend. The catastrophe of not being yeah. able to hug the mourner. Right. It, it's it's I, painful. I, it's difficult. It is very painful. I wonder what this would be like if we didn't have social media. Right. If we were, in fact, isolated from one another and couldn't do things like this. This is one of those times, like every, every, you know, every blessing has its downside. But this is clearly one of those times where the possibility of connection over social media is a blessing and it's where you have the possibility to reach. So, 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 th so. Think with me a generation from now when we are old, when we are old, of yes. course, and, and we turn to our descendants and they say to us, Papa, Papa David, what was it like in 20 when the plague hit the world? What, what do you think we're going to say? I learned how to sing while I wash my hands. I think that's basically, <laughs> that will be my, uh... so I, I honestly, I, I'm sorry to say this. I don't want to say this, yeah. but I think it's too early to say. Because most of us are still living essentially the lives we were living before, but with lots of social adjustments. Yeah. If we start to lose 
lose people who are close to us or we have more serious outbreaks. When you hear what's going on in Italy, the, what, what an Italian would say about his experience just up to today is very different, Eddie, from what you and I would say. And so at this point, I would say somehow the society managed to pull together when I was at the market, even though we were keeping away from each other, everybody was gracious and most people were kind. Yeah. We'll see. I hope yeah. that sustains itself. I'm, I'm concerned um, for the long term because this has taken away from Americans all of the things that make Americans, uh, that make American life sane. In, in yeah. the sense, all the things that we do to kill time. There's no sports. Uh, restaurants, right. bars, movies, and clubs are, are, are gone. Socializing yeah. is gone. Um, I think we're going to go stir crazy. I mean, I, I'm, I'm I worried mean, about that long term. I put out on the forward a list of books that people, long books that people could get into. <laughs> and I also, and, uh, and, and, and my, my daughter, who is 23, was talking this morning about how this is a good time for people to actually learn the sophisticated video games that are very preoccupying and, uh, and, have, and, can, and you can interact with them, of course, through other things. Um, as a nerd, I'm very happy to be able to be able to play chess online with people all over the world. You got to find something, something that engages you, you know? Right. Well, now you know why the Talmud was written. It, right. it was written right. to kill a couple of centuries while we're waiting for the Messiah and we can't get out exactly. of the crowd, you know? This is a great time to start Daf Yomi. You really have, you know, you have the time to study a page of Talmud a day. You really do. By the time um, they come up with a vaccine, you'll be a Talmud Chacham. I like that. Exactly. I like that. What, what are you well, that's, But the yeah. attitude, I just want to say that the attitude that we're sort of exemplifying is there are ways to make this into a blessing. That doesn't mean you're glad it happened. And on balance, it's obviously not a blessing. But there are ways to try to make this not just a bad thing. So, yeah, yeah, I, I think that's very, that's very, that's you know, you wrote about that once, and it was, it's a, yeah. it, it was a good book, by the way, and it was a beautiful yeah. lesson, and and I and I appreciate that very much. I, I, I appreciate that very much. So, yeah. what, what are you saying to your community in the moments that you can speak to them about how right. they uh, hold forth? I, I thought. I mean, that's work, part. Yes, yeah. please. Go ahead. No, go ahead, please. Barry Weiss wrote this very cute line that both you and I can re relate to. They said, for Persian Jews, social isolation is a wedding with only 400 guests. <laughs> and both of us have enjoyed, you know, the company of so many wonderfully yes. exuberant Persian Jews and wonderful simchas. But for all of our Jews, what are we, what are we saying to our communities about how to, how to hold strong through this? So let me give you an, an example. There is a family that I'm very close to, a Persian Jewish family that was going to have a big party for their daughter's bat mitzvah. Mm. And I wrote them a long letter and I said, you know, this, don't do this. It's not worth it, even though it's so painful not to do it. it this is a crucial time. And, and the father wrote back, he's a very gracious and thoughtful man. And he said at the beginning, I know this was a hard letter for you to write which was a very sensitive thing to say because right. it was a hard letter for me to write, to ask somebody not to do that. Um, but I think that people have to, to have, they have to avoid two dangerous syndromes. One is the syndrome of denial um, that this, you know, because you can't see it and because it hasn't hit you yet, it won't happen. And so I give them the example that was given actually in a Washington post column of the lily pad, that if you have a lily pad on a, on a lake, and it doubles every day. Um, on day 40, you'll barely notice them. On day 48, the lake will be covered. On what day will half the lake be covered? And the answer is day 47. Hmm. And that's what's happening with the pandemic. It's okay, it's okay, it's okay. And all of a sudden there's a huge flood right. because with something this contagious. So I try to persuade people to take action in advance of the lily pad covering the whole lake. The second thing that I say, um, which I'm sure you've been saying too, is that that this is a time when selflessness will actually end up protecting you. Um, I wrote to, to one of my congregants who was not willing to, was sort of being unkind to people who had been diagnosed. I said, look, today's accuser will be tomorrow's affected. 
Right. So you have to be, you really have to be both careful and kind. Um, we're all in this together. Yeah. Yes. So let me, let me ask you a follow-up. So, so we, we both have many physicians in our communities yes. and I'm, I'm worried for them and nurses and, and technicians, people who work in healthcare, because from the Italy example, first of all, if they get sick, we're sunk. But yeah. I'm I'm watching the exhaustion when uh, when they when when Ital Italian doctors are spoken to, I the people that I've talked to, it's the first time in my life I've ever heard a doctor express fear in their voice, and, yes. and these are these are seasoned I wouldn't say hardened professionals but they're certainly seasoned they've seen H1N1 they've seen AIDS they've seen tuberculosis uh, you know and w when a doc uh, of that caliber says to you you know yeah I'm worried. Yeah. What are, what are we going to say to them, Dan? So I don't know if you've heard this the same place I have. I listen to the Daily in the morning, the New York Times podcast. Yeah. And they've done a wonderful job. They interviewed an Italian doctor yesterday for close to a half hour. Um, today they interviewed Cuomo. And uh, each day they're, they're taking different aspects of the, of the coronavirus. Um, and all I say to them is that, you know, the same thing that I hear from your message, which is that self-care is indispensable for those who do other care. Yeah. You know, if you don't take care of yourself, we're, as you said, we're all sunk. You have to, what are you telling your doctors? Yeah. First of all, telling them that they're heroes and, and, you know, yeah. and, and, and help reminding them that, you know, for this, you were trained. I mean, it's what Mordecai mm -hmm. says to Esther. This is the reason right. you're there. And, and this yeah. is the reason you spent all of those years. When I went to parties in college, you were sitting and studying yeah. organic exactly. chemistry. Well, this is the reason. Yeah. Because when yeah. the crisis comes, you're the person standing between us and, and, and sickness and death. And right. we trust you with that. And we love you for that. And we will reward you with all of our love. But, uh, you know, yeah. and know that we care for you. And also, the other thing I tell them is I've told doctors many times, both you and I have had the unfortunate experience of being cancer patients. Um, you're not God. You didn't cause right. this. You're not responsible for causing it. You 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 have a limited number of tools to fight it. Um, and and so if if it doesn't work, we, we don't hold you responsible. Some right. of these guys That's hold it. themselves to a standard which is so high, and, and it breaks them to fail. They're warriors That's against death. That's incredibly important, right? Yeah. That's important to tell patients too, because sometimes we insist that our doctors be divine. Yeah. And, and, and the truth is nobody knows what this is gonna be or how this is going to act. And it is a different virus from the usual run of the mill flu. You know, it's, it's not the same. Right. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, both that, that the message of both humanity and, and appreciation, I think is a crucial one right now. Yeah. Let me, let me, I want to move off of this topic because it, it's a wonderful opportunity to have a moment with you in a sort of quiet, reflective way. And, and I want to, I've wanted to ask you this for a long time. I, I've been reading you for many, many years. And of course, like so many really enjoy your columns and your, your little shtickalach and then the, the books. Right. You've written. Yeah. And, and it occurs to me that David, you, you are the most talented reader I have ever met. The way that you now seriously, the, you write beautifully. You know that, and you speak wonderfully. But, but you know, as a rabbi, I know what's behind that, and I know that you are an exquisitely talented reader. The way that you read, and you find connections between Emerson and Talmud, between between English poetry and contemporary situations. So, for just a moment, could you reflect on how you read? Do you read with a pencil in your hand? Do you read with a notebook? I do. Do you? Do, do you I read with a pencil in my hand and I and I and I underline things and then I go back through the book and I uh, and and I write down lines that I particularly like. I started writing down lines that I liked all the way back in high school, which was a long time ago. Right. Um, and I think that the the way that I read is I don't so much I don't so much retain stories or characters, I retain lines. Wow. I can read a novel. Six months later, you can ask me what was the book about, and I go, I don't really remember, but I remember the character said this. Yeah, and and that's what I don't know why, um, but that's what sticks in my brain. Uh -huh. So, uh, and and when I read and I see such a line, 
it's very associative. I mean, I read sort of the way the Talmud works. It's like, you think that? Oh, it reminds me of this. Right. You think this? Oh, it reminds me of the other thing. Yeah. Um, and and so I, I'm not sure I, I would make like a bad architect because I don't necessarily see the overall design. When I was in high school, and this is still true, they would ask us to write outlines for papers. I would write the paper and then write the outline. <laughs> Because I think, I think by speaking and I think by writing, I can't think architecturally or tectonically. I have to just say it. And that's why in my sermons, I only have a couple of notes because I know that I have to speak them and that's how they come out. Uh -huh. So I just don't know. That's how my brain works. That's wonderful. Do you, where do you keep these things? Do you keep them in a... In a, in I a keep them in a completely or... unorganized file that goes back many years so that I'm not even sure I can retrieve the old ones because it's in a software that they don't make anymore. Oh, wow. um, but uh, but now I'm going to turn it on you. So you just wrote a book about, as you said, the most gifted pulpit rabbi of our time. I think there's no question about that. Uh, in all of our minds, it was Harold Schulweis. Um, and I don't think anybody could have succeeded Schulweis other than you. Wow. And and managed to be successful. No, I'm pretty sure about that. Uh, but what did you learn from him about what like the most important lessons that people could take away from a time like this? What do you think he would tell us? That's thank you for asking. That's a sweet question. Um, let me answer the other question first. See, I'm okay. the other way. I I remember stories because yes, I love stories. I know. And yep. You know, so I'm so jealous when I read the way that you write lines, and I, I you know, I also have a file, but it's a mess, you know. But the, uh, <laughs> but story, I'm always looking for interesting stories, because yeah. stories for me sort of capture a, a quality of human reality brought down to its essence, and that's what makes it so powerful. So when I started, sat down, to, I, I knew I wanted to write Harold's biography. I started working on this seven years ago, and the the problem was you have this vast life. And the question is to find the story of his life, to find mm. the through line, the, the, the plot, as it were. If you were a novelist, you would be looking for a plot or, or a, a basic skeleton of a plot. And, and as, I, as I began writing on him, I, I discovered, and I, I didn't really put this into words until I finished the book, which was that the, what he was able to do was to capture, again, the narrative of the moment narratives of American life, narratives of Jewish life, and correct them when he saw flaws in those narratives. And that really mm. is what Schulweis's genius was. For example, the, the famous one is he listened, he, he understood that the Holocaust narrative was becoming part of us, it was becoming a foundation of American Jewish identity in the post-war period. But he saw that it was destructive. That unlike Emil Fackenheim's uh, famous dictum, the Right. building a Judaism on a 614th commandment, a Judaism based on resentment against Hitler and contempt for the Nazis wasn't a positive statement about meaning in life. You needed right. something positive. And that's really what sent him to look for Christian rescuers and to retell the narrative of the Holocaust. He, he rejected the narrative of assimilation. He right. said, these are not... There's no inevitability or inexorable quality of assimilation that's gonna that's gonna destroy Judaism. Jews are leaving Judaism because Judaism is boring, because <laughs> it has nothing to say to life, because yeah. it's not speaking to the moments of our lives. And that's why he, you know, he that's why he spoke the way he did. And that's what he that that's why he organized the synagogue the way he did. So that, that the great lesson of his life is to listen for the core narrative. So see, what is the narrative we might be what is the narrative we might be missing now that he would spot and you can spot for us in this time? Well, I think what you said a moment ago is okay, what's the blessing here? And and I, I, I don't know about you, but I get up in the morning very early now and open my 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 computer to see all yeah. the new ways we're connecting with people. I've had conversations online with people I haven't talked to in years and years. Yeah. There's a strange blessing to this at the same time. That there's a, I think there's a powerful lesson in this, which is um, number one, we're connected to each other and we need yeah. connection, and number two, that that this attitude of I'm gonna, I'm gonna take care of my own and not yours. Okay, I mean, so I I um, it's an unethical narrative. There are also there are weird side byproducts of this. Yeah. Um, 
I, uh, I made of all things, um, since I never, I, or rarely, if ever cook, and when I cook, it's not really cooking, but I steamed some vegetables and scrambled some seitan because I'm a vegetarian. And my daughter came into the kitchen and saw it and said, I'm loving Apocalypse Dad. <laughs> you know, because before this, it was not, you know, and uh, so uh, I think that uh, it has forced both me and, and also forced her mom to do all sorts of things that, uh, you know, are, are outside the normal zone. And I think that's going to be true for all of us. I have a feeling some people are going to learn how to play piano because of this and other people are going to get into games or clubs or read books or that they never did because life has basically forced us to take a Shabbat. Yeah. Yeah. And look, and, li and it's forced us to recognize echad, that, that we're one. Yeah. Uh, th yeah. This, a, a butcher in Wuhan, China, butchers yes. some animal. And yep. the whole world shuts down a, yeah. a year later. I mean, just think of the interconnectivity of this world. Yeah. And this yep. is the disease of interconnectivity. This couldn't right. happen if we didn't have world travel, if we didn't have world commerce, and if supply nope. chains didn't cross oceans. It's in a remarkable statement of the oneness of this planet. It is. And the other thing that I think is really important, and I know that we talked about this the other day, so I know it's very much on your mind. Um, are the people who are really going to suffer, yeah. which is that there are a lot of people who are hungry or who live paycheck to paycheck or who are in service jobs or who own small businesses or who are homeless. And for them, this could really already be catastrophic. Yeah. And that's something that the Jewish community has to pay attention to and help take care of, as does the American community. And, and go one more step. I, I, my father is uh, still living. My father's 92. And he lives in a beautiful suburban rest home here in the valley. It's a gorgeous place. Um, and, and they're terrified. I mean, they, they have yeah. a facility with hundreds of older people. And uh, they, my poor dad is locked in his room. They, they deliver his meals three yeah. times during the day. He has a television. He has a computer. Um, he has a caretaker who comes to visit him during the day to help him. I, I think this is going to force us to rethink old age in some way. Yeah. Because, the, the, God forbid, this the virus gets into a place the way it did in Seattle. Right. But, but Look, more than I, that, I, the notion of isolating older people this way. We have found a better way to do this. Yeah, I was on the phone this morning, actually, with a congregant who was telling me that she can't visit her husband because he's in a nursing home. Right. And she can't see him. They can't visit and him. So, nope. It's all locked. It's quarantined. So yeah. it's you're right. We, we, we were not prepared for this. I mean, everybody knew in theory it could happen, but it happens in a Michael Crichton or a Stephen King novel. Right. It doesn't actually happen in life, but now it's happening in life. Right. But the, 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 this particular piece of it, it you know, instructs me that you know, we, we've reached a point where we can extend biological life into someone's ninth or tenth decade, but we haven't figured out what to do about, about soul, about community, about all right. the other needs of a human being. And to create this sort of, uh, you know, Moshav's Kenim, you know, a, a village of just older people, it's, that's not the model. I mean, it's clear that that's not, this is a biological indication right. that that's the wrong model. So I do think that uh, what Thomas Friedman wrote this morning in the Times, that there's going to be an AC and a BC, a before coronavirus and an after coronavirus, yeah. in terms of our social arrangements is true. I just don't know yet, nobody does, what this will look like. I do know that the only way to help shape it um, that will be consistent with our values is to remember that connection overrides everything and mm -hmm. that our connection to each other, to our people, to God, to our souls, that that has to be the guiding principle or, or we could very easily fall apart. Yeah. So in our, in our last moment or two, um, Pesach's coming. And, right. uh, un, well, that's exactly. Right. And unless, there's a, unless God, you know, there's a miracle yeah. of some sort of thing. Uh, they, they're testing the vaccine, but it won't be ready right. for quite a while. No. We're going to have a, a, a very strange Pesach. Yes. So what are we going to say this Pesach to each other? Um, I mean, it's weird to talk about the time of our freedoms, man, cherutenu, uh, when in fact we're all prisoners. Right. Um, I, I think 
the um, first of all, it's good. The preparations are going to be harder. The shopping is going to be harder. Keeping Pesach is going to be harder. Doing oh, seders are going to be tiny. I mean, someone asked me, should they have 70 people in their seder? I said, under no circumstances should you have 70 people to your seder. Right. Um, and, and I think that this has to be, I mean, maybe, maybe this year the seder is what it really is, which is the moment before you leave Egypt. Hmm. Remember that, that uh, Pesach really was before they left. Right. So maybe this year, that's what Passover is. It's not after we left Egypt, it's before. And we feel some of the same apprehension and fear that our ancestors felt before they left. Right. Yeah, and blood on the lintel ain't going to help this time. No, it is certainly not going to help. You'll In fact, I'd advise against it. <laughs> yeah. I would say Clorox wipes on the lintel are, are my suggestion. Uh, there you go. There you yeah. go. What, what, what happens, though? What's the message of a holiday then? Um, look, you know, people are going to ask us, where is God in all of this? You know, so where, where, yeah. where, where do we put God in all of this? Where, where do we find God in all of this, really? Um, well, I, I think that we find God in all the blessings that we've just been talking about, you know, yeah. in each other, in, in the fact that there are scientists all over the world who are working on this, in the fact that we're still celebrating Pesach thousands of years later, even in these straightened circumstances, yeah. the fact that you're worried about it, yeah. the fact that that's the question you ask, what do we do about Pesach when people are worried about a worldwide pandemic? I, I mean, I think that that's a beautiful question and there is some of god in that question i hope so yeah i would you know standing in line at the supermarket yeah. and a woman ahead of me was complaining that there was no toilet paper and yeah. the guy behind me had somehow snagged a 24 pack of charmin uh -huh. so he ripped it open and gave her a dozen rolls of, of toilet paper wow and said you you need these as much as i do and the wow. checker the checker looked at both of them and didn't ring it up for either one of them Really, the that's checker, a beautiful the, story. The checker just looked at he. He said, "How was he?" Didn't know how to do it anyway. And rather yeah. than call the manager, and he recognized Chesed, he yes. recognized Chesed where it lives, and just said, "Go, take it and mm -hmm. and, and be whole." And so somewhere in there, there's graciousness and there's moments of, of of Chesed, which is quite lovely. David, thank you for your time this morning. Thank you so much. God bless you. Be safe. Be well. Be well. You too. You too. Bye. Bye bye.